Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz. Well, as you know, I interview people from all over the world, though with an emphasis in the United States. And the first Monday of every month, I re-release a popular interview from the past that you might not have heard when it first came out. And for the past several what I call revisits, I've focused on very high-end event industry professionals from Australia. And coming up in two weeks, I'm re-releasing my interview of an Australian planner designer who has almost 400,000 followers on Instagram. It's a great interview, so be sure to watch out for that. Also, given that I live in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, I'm aware of and have worked with many highly qualified event industry professionals right in my backyard. And last week, I released my interview of planner designer Laura Ritchie from Grid and Grace from Washington, D.C., and... Today, I am featuring Jamesa Alexander, the founder of Jane Eyre Weddings and Events, which is a premier boutique planning agency founded in 2014. She is a published co-author of the anthology entitled Planners Unplugged and was recently named as Editor's Pick by Washingtonian Weddings for 2023. Jamesa was also named by Brides Magazine as a Black-owned wedding vendor to support new and always. Her work and contributions have been featured not only by Brides, but also by Glamour Magazine, Manalucci Bride, The New York Times, Washingtonian Weddings, and Wedding Sparrow. So enjoy this conversation with Jamesa Alexander. Hey, Jamesa, it's so good to see you actually in person. This is rare for me, you know? I'm excited. Yeah, I used to do this all the time in person, and then the pandemic hit, and I went virtual, and so, and I much prefer in person. I just feel it's more, you know, it's more engaging. You yeah. get to look across the table and chat and converse with friends and collaborate. And it yeah. just creates an energy that's different than being virtual. It does. It really, it really does. Well, you know, when I, when I um, think about you, you know, the first thing I, I kind of want to get into is, was there anything growing up, like in your childhood, that uh, kind of pointed the direction to what you would be doing today? Absolutely. Always wanting to help others, but I always like just parties and just fun gatherings. And so as a kid, I would host pizza parties at my parents' house. <laughs> I would charge the kids on the block a dollar. What? Seriously? Yeah, a dollar, two dollars. Yeah, and they would age? come. They would come and present uh -huh. their money. And my mom would be like, what? What is this two dollars? Why are you here? They would say, well, Jamesa said that she was having a pizza party here and that she was charging two dollars. And so it really kind of started uh, like that. But you know, as far as uh, just doing design and just planning, I feel like I've always just been a planner and just planning every single thing. I love the little Lisa Frank notebooks. They were fun and neon. And I would just, you know, write all of these life plans down, even as a kid. And I always knew I wanted to have a business. I just wasn't really sure what form of business I would have, but I always had that spirit of gathering, helping others in entrepreneurship. You know, it's interesting. So many people I've interviewed, whether they're a photographer, floral designer, planner, there's something in their childhood with most of them. Like I remember, I forget who it was. It was some really major like floral designer who, or, or, or regular designer, event designer who would move furniture around at the age of like six, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the parents' house, they, they come into the room and they're like, what's going on? And he's trying to pull the couch and stuff like that. It's funny, but you know, it's funny when I, when I look up information on you, I saw that you got a bachelor's of science in, if I'm saying this right, kinesiology. Yes. And then a master's of business administration. Kinesiology. Okay. So I had to Google it, you know, <laughs> I, what do I know? And it said study of mechanics of body movement. Yes. So um, I did study kinesiology at the University of Maryland College Park. And I really thought that I was going to be a, pretty much a biomechanics like engineer and creating prosthetics to help maybe folks that have been wounded in car accidents or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I really just liked um, just the human body and just what it's capable of doing. And I did that form of study um, and I graduated with, you know, a degree of in basically in public health. And I thought that I was going to be a physical therapist, but then I, I just never really found interest in it after I graduated um, with my bachelor's degree. And I always was interested in business and running a business. And so I went back to grad school um, to do, do get my MBA <laughs> to start a business. And so um, I think, Doing the MBA was definitely something that set me up 
to start my business. Mm -hmm. And even then, I still didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to start it, but I had the skill sets to be able to do it. And I never worked in hospitality or uh, event management or anything of that nature, but I was willing to learn and I was willing to take the risks <laughs> yeah. and, and jumping into an industry that I really didn't know much about, but was so fascinated by it. Well, then how did you start your business? Like, did you, you know, like a lot of people tell me a friend asked them to do a wedding or something. How did you do it? Absolutely. So I actually started my business in probably one of the worst times of my life. Honestly, um, I, I was literally at the tail end of a divorce. I really started a business just out of means of survival and wanted to create additional income for myself to still maintain a certain lifestyle. And it was interesting because I did choose to go into the wedding planning business. And even though I didn't have that happiness for myself, I found great pleasure in being able to still celebrate others on their journey. And it really gave me hope that one day I, you know, the tables would turn, I would be able to experience what some of my other clients and couples were. And it really kept me encouraged. And I'm really grateful for the business. I did do my friend's wedding. Um, that was the first one that I ever uh -huh. did. I yes. was right. Yes. Okay. And so that was the first wedding I ever did. And I did her wedding and it was, it actually got published and it was featured and it was the first one I had ever done. And I think that once that happened, it really just kind of jolted something inside of me that yeah. said, you know what, maybe you have something here. Maybe, you know, you should consider, you know, really taking this seriously and, and launching and doing a business. And so then I did a couple of her friends, you know, events and parties after. And then I said, okay, this is it. I think I've got something here and I'm going to get started. Yeah. And so I did. And I, and I did start. What would you say, you know, makes you, you, I mean, almost like a personal signature in terms of you as a planner and designer is, I know that's kind of a big question, but are you able to kind of identify what, what sets you apart and what's, is, what's unique to you and your personality and style? Absolutely. So I think each person, no matter who you are, in what industry you are, we all have a superpower that only we can provide and put out into the world. And I think that there is room for everyone, no matter who you are. And for myself, I really like to specialize in the art of storytelling. And when I plan events and I design events, I really curate it specifically for the celebrant or for the couple, because I feel like everyone's journey is different. And I really want the guests to be able to experience that when they come to the wedding. I think people create a lot of beautiful things, but a lot of times when I just see it online, I'm like, well, where does the couple show up? What's the story behind it? What do all the details you know, really mean and matter? And so when I do Instagram stories, and I know people always love to watch our stories because I do make it like a TV show. That's what grabbed my attention, <laughs> by the way. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. And it, and it is. It's Welcome to the Jane Eyre Show, the Eyre and I'm so glad to have you here. And I really bring them into the world and behind the scenes of every event that we produce because I really want people to know the story of the celebrant or the couple because I think that that's something that's so important. And it's your story, it's your uniqueness that adds value and that allows you to inspire others. Yeah. Do you have any particular techniques or ways that you uncover their story before you then manifest it in, in terms of an event? I love that question. Absolutely. So a part of the process that I do with each of my clients is we do a design questionnaire. In that questionnaire, I like to ask a lot of lifestyle questions to really learn who they are. Where do they shop? What do they like to eat? What's inspiring to them? What are some of their favorite places that they've traveled to? Um, anything that is important to them. I really like to understand that. And that questionnaire is that first steps are really just diving in and learning more about them. I ask them, are there any specific uh, slogans or uh, scriptures or anything that is um, something that would resonate with them Ooh, like to be able that. to see that, you know, into a design. Yeah. And that's how you really understand who your clients are. And I, and I take that time to learn and go through that whole questionnaire process. And that's actually a part of our design process. And so when we produce events, it's why all of our events look completely different. None of them look the same because I'm really taking the time to really learn and understand who the clients are and what we can provide to them, how we can showcase their story. Do you have um, a story that you can use to illustrate this? Like, um, you know, maybe a favorite one that you've done or one that's coming up. Just just an example of, of what you learned about them and how you then 
bring that out in, in the form of the event. Absolutely. So recently we did a wedding at the Intercontinental at the Wharf in D.C. And it was for Mia and Wole's wedding. And Wole's last name actually means small tiger in Nigerian. And so hmm. I incorporated a small tiger into their monogram, into the design. Oh so when gosh. the guests actually came to the wedding, a lot of them actually understood what it meant to see the small tiger yeah. and how that was just something that only a person close to that family would know. Right. You wouldn't just, you know, see that last name and know that that's what it meant. Yeah. But we put it on the invitations. It was on the dance floor wrap. Um, we also had it incorporated onto the menu cards and just all the small details. And I just loved it so much because when the guests came into the room, you saw their faces just light up and they were like, oh my gosh, like this pays homage to our legacy to becoming one and being able to carry on that last name, which is something that's so very important. And I would not have learned that or known that <laughs> without going through the design questionnaire with the couple and then explain that to me and how they wanted to see that show up. Wow. that That's fantastic. You know, also, Jamesa, I'm wondering. My experience in the band business is that I used to perform and be the MC and all that for like 20 something years. And there was always something that would go wrong at a wedding, even my own. I mean, I, I remember there was an issue with, uh, the, the, it was a heat wave had happened and the air conditioner where the ceremony went, you know, went down. And, and I knew just, it's okay. Just be chilled out about it. I mean, it, we're going to be fine. The love in the room and everything like that. And I remember that when, when, I would run into issues connected to the band, something that I couldn't control, whatever, uh, or an issue at, with the party that was making it hard for us to do what we wanted to do. I remember I would walk really fast. I would look tense. I would have band people pull me aside and say, Andy, you're making us anxious. <laughs> you know. And I had to learn almost like a muscle to just stay cool, stay relaxed, don't show it. I don't want the client to see it. You know, I don't want the band to see it. I want to get them all riled up. And it took me time. I mean, how do you handle when there's a challenge? And, and, you know, if, and if you have an example of a big one and how you overcame it, but how do you handle that? That's so good, Andy. I think that even put events aside, I think in life you always have a crisis. There's always something that's going to happen unexpectedly. And how do you handle that? Yeah. And Prior to me actually starting my business, uh, well, actually at the start of my business early on, I worked at the Boeing company and I worked in the aerospace and defense industry. And it's very interesting because during my tenure there, I worked there for 10 years. I saw crisis after crisis and really just managing and damage control and how do we move forward as a company. And I think I took a lot of those skill sets with me when I started my business to be able to manage crises and events. And, you know, um, from the Ethiopia Airlines plane crash, you had the Lion Air, um, the Dreamliner with the battery, lithium ion battery not working, and just so many different challenges that the company faced that I was a part of, whether it be on the finance side or project management. And you saw how it affected the lives of others, but I also think about my business too, because everything that we do really affects the lives of others. And we only get one time yeah. to do this. I yeah. don't get another opportunity to come back and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't get this right on your wedding day. Uh, no, that's not <laughs> going to work. Right. That's not okay. Right. And so on event days, I think it really starts with just the proper preparation leading up to the event day to really just minimize risk and anything that could go wrong. But in the event that things do go wrong or something is not right, I think think it's about being collaborative. That vendor team is so important. Yes. They really band together yeah. to make things right, to correct things quickly. It's really, like you said, keeping your cool and really being able to strategically engage and have conversations during conflict and creating a resolution. And that's always my goal anytime that something happens during an event is how do we create a resolution? What options do we have at this point? A, B, and C happened. It's already done. But how do we manage and move forward so that the event is still a success? In most cases, we are able to communicate without having to include the couples or, you know, the clients and letting them know what's going on. The vendors were usually able to work around. We've allowed ourselves five to six, even more day before setup time before the event. So in the event that we do have a crisis, we're able to still get it all resolved before the event starts. And it's just all a part of having the right vendor team, 
collaborating, having the conversations, communicating, even if you have to over communicate as much as possible to really minimize the risk. But when you do have a challenge on event day, you can never really get emotional about it. I think a lot of my clients and couples, <laughs> they say I'm too calm or too cool oh, and it makes them nervous. I actually had a client one time that said to me, I do exit interviews after each event. And he literally said, he was like, Jamesa, I just couldn't put my finger on you. He said, you were just always just so chill and even kill. And it made me nervous because I was like, <laughs> why is she not? <laughs> you know? And I just told him, I said, you know, I'm not really uh, a type a um, individual that's just, you know, very flighty. I really like to think about everything holistically and really figure out everything. And it comes from just working for an engineering data-driven company in oh, that background. Interesting. You, you really are always in a mode of just um, project management and how do you mitigate risk constantly. Mm. You're never really in panic mode or focusing, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, this is happening. This is happening. Because you don't have time to do that. Yeah. You have to be really quick. You have to understand how to move figure out what's next, what other options do we have, and then make an executive decision and move forward. So that's in life in general. So not even for event Seriously, based. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's in life in general. You know, it's interesting. I, I want to add to that too, because I always, I also find that if I assume, I mean, I had to learn this over time. If I assume there's a solution, right? I, I am, it, 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 I don't know what it is. I don't know if the universe provides or something, but it, it, it's less stressful and we do figure it out mm-hmm. just to assume there is a solution. I just have to find what it is, but there is a solution that exists for absolutely. every problem. Absolutely. For everything. Yeah. For everything. Absolutely. Because on event days for me, you know, it's the answer is not going to be no. It's okay. Well, what else? What else? Right. What else? That's right. always, I'm in a mode of what else. I never want to go to a client and say, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. No, I want to go to them and say, unfortunately, X, Y, and Z happened. However, here's the resolution. Here's the options mm-hmm. that we do have. Present options and solutions. That's what people pay us the big bucks. Yes, seriously. (laughs) No, they do. I want to make sure that you're aware of two other shows that are on the Wedding Biz Network. First, The Business of Being Creative, hosted by founder and president of The Business of Being Creative, Sean Lowe. Sean's consulting firm is focused on providing practical advice to those in the business of being creative. Tune in every Tuesday to hear a new episode chock full of topics and advice for creative businesses. Also, check out the two seasons of Stop and Smell the Roses, hosted by the one and only lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Preston speaks with such an honest voice, I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy hearing him on this unique platform. You can find both shows at theweddingbiznetwork.com or on your cell phone's podcast app for both The Business of Being Creative and stop and smell the roses. You mentioned earlier the team, even the vendor team. And I think that's so important too. There there was one event, it was uh, in DC. I I can't get into the whole story. It's crazy long. But the essential story was that the groom's mother disappeared, like for the ceremony. Like they couldn't find her. It's a long story what happened and eventually everything was okay. Uh, the bottom line was she wasn't supportive. I mean, it was horrible. She wasn't sort of mm, yeah. I have one of those stories too. <laughs> oh God. But but the thing is, in terms of how we handled it, I remember the planner got her team together and I, I saw what was going on that looked very concerned and it was going on. And then I came over, I said, you know, what's going on? And then the photographer came over. Eventually the entire team was together and we all ended up working together to help support them, the the planner and and that whole team. And you know, it had some contingencies and how we were going to deal with this. And uh, that was one of the biggest examples to me of the whole team coming together. And, and I, you know, I also noticed, I don't know if it was a website or an interview, I think in your website, um, in terms of the, the, the creative partners that you work with, you mentioned that you provide your clients uh, a list of creative partners that are aligned, not only with their budget, but with their overall vision. So I'm also curious, how do you choose the creative partners that you're going to work with? How, how do you approach that? I love that question. And I think that that's so important because you're really only as good as the vendors that are behind mm. you, your creative team to really execute the event. And every vendor is not always going to be the best fit for the vision that I have. Certain florists have certain skill sets. If I know that they specialize in installations, 
or large scale productions, then I will align them with that couple to execute a specific vision. If I know that, you know, I have a couple that is looking for, you know, diversity or any type of inclusion, it's really important to really understand what your clients are looking for, what they desire, because I really curate the vendor team to make sure that they do align with everything that the couple couple values, what's important to them. But also I know that they can execute what it is that they're looking for in the overall design aesthetic. And so for every single wedding that we do, I really create a a vendor portfolio or profile to present to the couples or to the clients so that they understand why I'm selecting them, Uh why I think that they're a good fit, um, what skill sets they possess to be able to produce the outcome that we're looking for. And I think that's so important. You do have planners that, you know, will work with the same vendors primarily for that. And I do understand that and I get that. But I, what I see a lot of times is that sometimes the events tend to look all the same. Mm -hmm. There's no variation. There's not a huge, you know, difference. And because every event I produce is so different, a lot of times that vendor profile may also be different. I don't work with the vendors, all the same vendors for every single event all the time. Now I am very strategic though, in the vendors that I choose, and I do have certain qualifications that for me, what does their back in business look like? How efficient are they with invoicing and contracts huh. and things like that? Because yeah. the vendors need to also align with my process and the level of service that I provide to the clients. And if it doesn't, then they're not a good fit for my vendor team because I never want there to be a lapse or gap in how I interact with my clients, my response times, my efficiency, my professionalism with other vendors that don't align or embody the same qualities that my business does. It's very, very important. I take it very seriously, but that's really how I go about selecting the right vendors that are a good fit for my events. To what degree do you include them ahead of time in terms of vision? Do you like to be, uh, which is fine, very directive about it or how, how much input, to what degree do you take input from them? Um, how much do you include them or not? For vendors? Yeah. So for the vendors, it's very collaborative and I include them quite a bit. A lot of times I will present an overall design guide and aesthetic of what it is that we're looking for. I walk them through the vision of what I would like to see. But I think the beauty and the collaborative part is allowing the creative to be able to express in their form of what it is that I'm looking to see. And I think that's important. I don't really micromanage or say that it has to be exactly this way because a lot of times, Again, it goes to that superpower that each vendor has and possesses. Yeah. And sometimes I may have a vision and be able to show it to them, but I also like to see how do they interpret what it is that I'm looking to see for the That's event good and how they can design right. it and create it. Because I am uh, not a florist. I'm not a fabricator. <laughs> You know, I'm not an engineer. I am the mastermind and magician of the overall grand scheme of what we want to see. But they are really the worker bees that have the skill sets to really produce what it is they were looking for. So I spend a lot of time with them having conversations. How do we know that this will or will not work? Can it support the weight of this? You know, you start to really ask a lot of fact finder questions. Mm -hmm. And again, when you come from an engineering fabrication, aerospace and defense background, it really helps you to ask the right questions to really be able to build and produce some amazing things. Like you can't build an airplane or a spaceship not asking, you know, yeah. the right questions, the proper questions. And so for me, I was not a technical mastermind behind a lot of the technology for the various vessels that we were creating or building, but I had enough knowledge and skill sets to be able to ask certain questions to really understand can this metal part withstand a bazillion, bazillion uh, degrees, you know, in space to land on a on a docking station at, at the International Space Station? Mm-hmm. You know, so when I think about that for events, I'm asking the same type of questions right. of if we're creating this rig to do a ceiling install, well, how much weight can this support? Are there enough rigging points? Mm. You know, do we need a lift to be able to do this? Right. How much time is it going to take? And I start to really engage the vendors in asking all of those questions because that translates into dollars that I need to educate my clients on on how much this design is going to cost them right. <laughs> based on all the materials, elements, tools, labor that we need to produce it. And, and it's very, very similar. And I think that when you really just think about life and 
no matter what industry you're in. Like I said, I didn't come from hospitality, not event management, but I already had the skill sets. It looked very different in aerospace and defense, but I'm using those same skill sets to plan events and execute them successfully. And it, they really go hand to hand. You know, I like so much about what you're saying about the collaborative process. And, and again, with my own personal experience, I can only speak from the musician side of it. And I love when a planner, planner, designer, whatever, will say to me, um, what do you think of the timeline? Like like this crowd, you know, we've hired you because we want kick-ass band. We mm -hmm. want it to be a rockin' party. Um, do, do you have any anything, any suggestions or anything like that? I love that because, um, like, for here's one example for me, just one little example. And you'd be surprised how many times it comes up where a planner will have, let, let's say that the entree is over at eight. Let's just make that up. And on the timeline, they have the cake cutting at 825, you know, and I'll say only if, you know, if it's appropriate for mm -hmm. me to involve myself <laughs> in it, I'll say to them, you know, with all due respect, um, you know, I, you talk to me about how you really want the dance floor packed and all of that and, and, and everything. If the entree ends at eight, that's really, as you know, Jamesa, when the party really explodes, takes off and 25 minutes isn't really enough time to build momentum. Like I feel like, and, and I say it in a real gentle way, but it's like we're cutting, can you move the cake cutting even back just 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, something like that. And, and I find, you know, most are, are going to be open to that, but I really love when I'm asked and when they listen and we have a conversation together about that. Does that make sense? That's so good. So in my process, in the planning process, once I create the timeline, I actually do a preliminary version that I send out to all the vendors. And then we schedule check-in calls to go through the timeline together. Oh, I like that. That allows for the vendors and I to really have those candid conversations to make sure we actually have enough time and what we are planning to execute makes sense. I think that that's so important. That's an important process because a lot of times when I do those check-ins, we do update the timeline. We do make edits and changes. I talk with the photographer, videographer, DJ, band, whomever the key partners are that are going to be producing this event yeah. to make sure we're all on the same page. And that's where even if it's over-communicating, I would rather over-communicate to make sure that we fully understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's at stake on the wedding day and what's happening um, versus not. And then you are, you know, yeah. <laughs> putting out a lot of mini fire drills on the wedding day or event day because we did not have those conversations beforehand. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was going to ask you, um, how you bring in the business aspect, because obviously to have a successful, uh, company like you do, it's not just the creative side, the artistic side, but you've got to have a business hat. It's so clear that you have a business hat in addition to the, the design. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's really important because you do, like you said, there are people that are very creative. They do have the skill sets to just really create and generate amazing things, but they may not be the best business owner or yeah. have all the skill sets to run a business. And I have spent a lot of time, whether it be just from formal education, uh, working at various companies or businesses to really um, build those skill sets, but then also just continuing to invest in myself and going to conferences and really mm -hmm. um, even hiring a business coach. Hiring a business coach, that really I changed believe in that too, a mentor. the game for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still working with my same business coach. We've been working together for three years now, going on four years. And I think it's so important to continue to evolve and to educate no matter yes. what age, um, range that you've been in business. It's just always good to continue to evolve because I had, you know, like I told you, I had this saying, <laughs> you either roll with the punches or you get knocked out and you really have <laughs> to be willing to adapt and change and evolve. Otherwise you just go extinct. You're not relevant. Yeah. People don't need your services anymore. Yeah. And you have to be willing to really learn and continue to educate and invest yourself to really be the best you can be over time and to have longevity. What what's what's the hard part for you in all of this? Like like what you know, whether it's as an uh, the artistic side or the business side, like what what do you still struggle with? What's the difficult part of all this? The hard part that people don't talk about a lot is when you are having a successful business. Um, it seems like you have it all put together, but you're not able to win at home. And I think that a lot of the oh, challenge you mean balance you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of the challenge is being able to still manage the home life in the work life balance when you do have two small children, 
um, a husband and just doing all of the things. And, yeah. and, you know, it's so funny because, and, and I don't care saying this, and I, you know, as a mom and a wife, but, you know, I used to talk so much crap about like Kim K and all her nannies and all these things, but here I am, <laughs> here I am, Andy, <laughs> considering, you know, doing the same and just getting additional help and support because it is a lot. And I think that people don't have the conversations enough of what it's like. You know, I've worked Uh, plenty of seasons, you know, pregnant with my son, with my daughter and just going, going, going and just having the mental willpower and strength to do that and manage a home. It is hard. And I think that for me, the creative process, the business, that's the easy part, but it's really that home life and getting the proper work balance, which can be a challenge sometimes because we do want to, you know, work and we want to do all these amazing things. But then sometimes, you know, my husband really has to say, okay, Jamesa, I love and support you, but it's time for you to go have a seat now. Right. <laughs> you know, right. We will, you know, we want to have dinner. We want to do things. And so keeping them at the forefront. And so I think just as a look ahead for myself, um, just really making sure that I have discernment on choosing the right events to work so uh, that I do have that time to spend with my family because the kids are getting older. They're not getting younger. That time, it, it just, it's gone. You don't get it back. And if you don't really maximize, you know, what you're doing and really understand having that balance, I do see a lot of professionals in this industry, you know, where the home work balance life isn't as great. And I think that's something that not only myself or others struggle with, and, you know, that's just being really honest and candid. And so I'm very aware of that and really working to make sure that I do have a good balance. Yeah. No, I appreciate, Jamesa, that you're being so open and vulnerable about this because so many people either have kids or they want to have kids. Absolutely. And and also want to have a career that not only sustains them, you know, financially, economically, but just also their spirit and everything else. And I also think that there's a, there's a, also a a positive side to it too, for the kids, which is setting an example, being role models that mommy, daddy, uh, have passions in their life and, and they're taking care of themselves and their family and they have a career that is exciting to them and fulfilling. I think that's also important too. Very much so. It's very important. And I think that People can really learn to talk to their kids too because yes. they have a perspective yeah. in, in what it is that you do in what your scope of work is. You know, um, how how am I able to provide you with chicken nuggets and Chick-fil-A? <laughs> <laughs> that's, and, that's and that's the, that's the way to talk, talk about to, it. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly the way. That's funny. You know, that's the way to frame it for them. But yes, that, that home work-life balance, it, it is really important and it is a fine line. And that is something that I think is a challenge sometimes when you do want to work all of these, produce these amazing events, but you really have to continue to put your family first. Because again, you know, without them, <laughs> there's no That's need right. in even having a business yeah, you know, or income yeah. to support them. Well, before we go, um, I want to ask too, I understand you're the co-author of an anthology called Planners Unplugged. Can you tell me about that and Absolutely. how people can get a hold of it? Yeah. Um, so you can just send us an email at jamesa at janeair.com. Um, and so that book, I really, really, well, first of all, I commend anybody that's an author, period. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> writing a book is no joke. I, I'm quite sure it's much easier now with AI and chat GPT from what I hear. Well, but... Still, it's a task. <laughs> it's a task. But yes, anyone that is an author that has written a full book, I really commend you. I only wrote a chapter in this anthology Mm. and that was really thought provoking. I thought, you know, very challenging and time consuming, but the book is really a collection of a lot of other planners just sharing their stories and their journeys and how they got into this business, challenges that they faced along the way and how they've overcome them. And Mm. I really love the book and it was a great opportunity to be a part of it. I never foresaw myself um, co-authoring or writing, you know, any type of publication, but I appreciated the art and craft of being an author so much more after going through that process because there's so much that goes into it. You really want what you're putting the pen to paper to be meaningful. You want to uplift, you want to inspire others. And I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, God, Jamais, this has been such a pleasure. I mean, I, this, this is an, has been an amazing conversation. So thank you for taking the time and coming out here for this. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. And I hope that the listeners are inspired. I hope they have a good time listening to our chat. <laughs> I think so. All right. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Jamesa Alexander. Be sure to check out her website, which is janeair.com. That's spelled J-A-Y-N-E-H-E-I-R.com. 
Her social media handles on Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest is Jane Eyre. And on Facebook, you could find her at Jane Eyre Weddings. And be sure to check out the show notes with the event picks that Jamesa provided at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And I want to make sure that you're aware of two shows that I produced. Uh, one it has two seasons with Preston Bailey, and his show is called Stop and Smell the Roses. And then there's another one with Sean Lowe, who releases episodes every other Tuesday, and that's called The Business of Being Creative. You can find both shows, Preston Bailey's Stop and Smell the Roses and Sean Lowe's show, The Business of Being Creative, on the WeddingBizNetwork.com or by the show name on your cell phone's podcast app. And next week, since it's the Christmas holiday, there will be no episode. So we'll catch you in a couple weeks on The Wedding Biz. 